Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 699. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's November 9th, 2021. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. We know you take a lot of time out of your schedule to be here with us. Yeah, if you're a true fan and you're listening to both episodes a week, that's about two hours out of your time. Wow, thank you. Uh, before we get too far into the episode, please like, share, uh, comment, uh, anything else? Uh, if you want to do the podcast, you can do the podcast. It, it, hopefully you're just seeing these little icons on the screen, so I don't have to keep talking about what you should be doing as an audience member. George, I'm looking outside. The sun has finally reappeared after our rainy weekend in <laughs> Central Florida. How you been doing? I'm wonderful. I'm so excited. I started my confirmation classes for young people and adults. Our bishop is coming in December, and I've got three babies set to be baptized, half a dozen teens, mm -hmm. and anywhere from eight to 18 adults to be confirmed or received. And I really love teaching the, uh, most of my people are not from an Anglican or Episcopal background. They come to this church because of word of mouth and friendships or because uh, they've heard something about it. And so we have a lot of people who will take me up and say, Father George, uh, why do you keep talking about when people die, they don't go to purgatory, they go to heaven? Or, Father George, what is that woman doing up next to you at the altar? Well, she's a deacon. <laughs> and in other words, we have people coming from Catholic and Baptist and even a few Pentecostals uh, background. It's Florida. People move here, they start their lives over again. Sure. And it's really wonderful to teach that Henry VIII did not start the Church of England. And uh, oh. so... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, and for those of you who uh, really would like to see George's version of Fractured Fairy Tales uh, about the history of Anglicanism and our doctrines and beliefs, it'll be on the parish website and Facebook pages. Good. And if you watch all the shows, uh, come and get confirmed by Bishop Greg Brewer of Central Florida. <laughs> I won't stop you. No, no. This is so sad. A membership requirement. That's cool. All right. See, we are. Yes, membership in the body of Christ. <laughs> that's the requirement. We are members of our church back in uh, Connecticut, Church of the Apostles. And basically, Church of the Apostles has a membership requirement. How many times you kind of basically have to attend throughout the year. And Jill and I are, are, are off that mark a little bit. We show up for June and then we're gone. And so uh, they're being very kind to let us stay in the membership roles. Uh, we certainly love tithing to them, and we watch them every Sunday on uh, their Facebook Live feed. That's, that's really cool. But we also visit other churches in our travels. This week, we went to Epiphany Celebration Church in Mount Dora, Florida. I think it's actually Eustis, Florida, but nobody knows where that is. And I'm going to tell you right now. That's the suburb of Mount Dora. Mount Dora yeah, it's, is it's, not it's a mount. It's the Alpine sector. <laughs> It's the Alpine section of Florida. Yeah. It's at least 60, 70 feet above sea level. Wow, it's huge. It's hilarious. And so we. Snow Peak <laughs> Mountains in that part of the state. I didn't have to put it in low gear to go down the hill. Um, but it, they had a baptism this Sunday. It was really cool because uh, since COVID, I've not attended a baptism. And it was just wonderful to, to welcome new people uh, uh, into the church, the body of Christ. And so. Well, um, life in Christ is good, Kevin. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. so. so for all those opposed to. Uh, children's baptism uh pick another channel yes. we're happy with it <laughs> we'll, we'll take anybody all right so let's go on here good news story my good news stories is i uh, technically the u.s borders are now open the long lines between canada and uh the u.s uh are open and people are are going to be spending their 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 winter their winter months down in florida They've opened up the, the border. All the RVers are going to come down here, and my property value will go up, which is cool. But we have other good news stories, too, as well, George. What do we got out there? Well, we've got a few. We've got several, in fact. Mm -hmm. Some, one, well, let's start with the Welsh story. One of our viewers, Joshua, 
Joshua Maynard. He is vicar, let me look it up exactly, he's a vicar in the Church of Wales. Mm -hmm. And as we've reported on this show, the Church in Wales has changed its marriage canons to allow for same-gender marriage. That they've, they've swallowed the Kool-Aid, if you will. And there is an evangelical fellowship in the Church in Wales, and they're, they've reached out to GAFCON and the Global South for support. And uh, Josh, who is the vicar of Huddleton, Stackpole, Botherston, St. Tin Willis, and Angle, one, two, three, four, five, poor guy must have six, six churches, in Pembrokeshire, has withdrawn from the church in Wales and mm -hmm. is planting an, a church in the Anglican tradition called Wellspring Church. Yes. On Anglican Inc., I'm going to post some more details about this. Now, why is this a good news story? Well, it's a bad news story because we don't like—I don't like to see fights or schisms. Mm -hmm. But it's a good news story because here's somebody who is standing on his conscience, standing on his beliefs in the inerrancy of God's word, and is doing the right thing when the whole culture in which he is would tell him, "Oh, you're making a terrible mistake." And I salute him in his endeavor. I pray that his parish succeeds. Building a church from scratch is a hard job. Oh, it is. Oh, um, absolutely. A ask ACNA. It's very difficult. I mean, th and, but that's the reality and, now we're faced with is the church body there uh, in Ireland and in, in the UK is not serving the church. It's, yeah. Now, I have just am so fortunate to be in a wonderful parish, really mm -hmm. a wonderful parish, in a wonderful diocese. So all the nonsense and stuff that I read about, I read about. It's not part of my lived experience as a Christian around here. Mm -hmm. And I guess there are parts of the Church of England where you can be very happy and be very productive and very successful. Holy Trinity Brompton, for instance, is doing fantastic work. Mm -hmm. But what if you're in a smaller church, in a diocese that is not so keen, where the bishop is not such a nice person, who teaches things that you know and believe not to be true? What do you do? Well, Each uh, of us have to make our own decision in that, in that situation. But here's somebody who's taken a brave step out. But you do have the shared experience. You were part of the Diocese of Pennsylvania. You do know what it's like to have a, a bishop who's hostile to the gospel you're trying to preach yeah so yes but i had no problem telling him what i thought about him which <laughs> which resulted well if it had been 15 years later i would have been deposed for abandoning the communion of the episcopal sure. church because i yeah. told the bishop he was an idiot now in the 90s in the 90s and late 80s that just meant i'm going to transfer you to pittsburgh and if you're from philadelphia saying you're going to be sent to pittsburgh it's like it's like being sent to Okeechobee down here in Florida. You know, we just look down our noses at people in the western half of the state. I'm being facetious, friends. No, 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 I no. don't look down my nose. Well, but uh, I've been very fortunate. I've mm -hmm. never had to compromise my faith. And it's meant that when I applied for jobs as a, at a church in the Diocese of Newark in the 90s, uh, Jack Spong was quick to say, thank you, no. Uh, and other places have turned me down without a moment's thought. Sure, but in the but I really do think it's the leading of the Spirit to bring me here to Hooterville, and God's blessings are abundantly clear. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruits of the ministry, are are can be seen. Um, now around the world, there's a lot of corruption in culture, but there's also corruption within the church. We joke all the time, Church of India could be in the news uh, basically four hours a day for an Anglican unscripted show. There's a lot of corruption, but we find corruption in China, Asia churches. We find corruption also in Latin America. And specifically, there's a lot of corruption in the Mexican church. And the Mexican church just uh, elected a new bishop. And I thought we could talk about that in light of the corruption they've suffered for centuries uh, as a church. So l l let's add it now. It's a woman bishop. For many of our audience, that's going to be, well, I'm tuning out right now. No, I, I think that the greater topic here is what's happening in Mexico. Don't tune out just because it's a, it's a woman bishop. Please listen to the story. George, tell us the story here. Put a little context. Mexico is going through a very, very bad time mm -hmm. with corruption 
uh, murder death. The murder rate only the murder rate is worse across the border in Guatemala and Honduras, mm. but that's not saying much. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people have been killed in, by the drug cartels. And just recently, it's starting to get bad so that there was a shootout in Cancun between two drug, rival drug cartels that wounded some tourists. And up to this point, the army and the police have made very sure that uh, the drug cartels keep their business. They'll sell their drugs, but no turf fights in the, in the tourist places. Now the violence is spreading over and hurting tourists. Mm -hmm. The Mexican government, Mexican police, even the church in some parts of the country are infected by narco-terrorism, we call it, and the gangs. Meanwhile, there is growth. The Diocese of the Southwest and the ACNA is experiencing rapid growth. It's based really in New Mexico, El Paso, but its massive growth is taking place all across northern Mexico. And that we have an honest church, a God-fearing church, a church with a Catholic liturgy that appeals to the sensibilities of the Mexican people that is squeaky clean. So we're seeing great growth and strides in the Diocese of the Southwest, which the ACNA can hold up as an example of multicultural uh, engagement as well as wonderful evangelism. Downside is they're poor as church mice in Mexico, so yes. they need help, and they, and so they're going to hit the wall at a certain point when they run out of money and no longer have the money to be able to help send somebody a thousand a month to run a little church in a Mexican town. There is an Anglican church in Mexico, which was part of the Episcopal church in Mexico. And the Anglican church in Mexico has a unique history. The American missionaries went down in the 1870s, but at the same time, at the end of the 19th century, you had something akin to the old Catholic movement, where Mexican Roman Catholics quit the, Me the Catholic church because it was uh, too Roman, too foreign influenced, and they were more Mexican nationalists, and they formed uh, their own Mexican Catholic Church, which merged with the American missionaries to become the Anglican Church in Mexico. In the early part of the 20th century, Mexico had a terrible revolution, very vicious anti-clerical laws that are on the books still. Still, yes. And for instance, the church in Mexico, as corporate entities, I don't think can hold property, or they couldn't for a long time. It may have mm -hmm. changed recently, but that meant that all property was vested in the person of a bishop. So the bishop of the diocese owned the church, had ultimate control over the bank accounts. It was a, in America we have them called corporate souls, where there's one shareholder, one person in a corporation. They have the Mexican equivalent of that. Now when you have a God-fearing, honest bishop, that's a wonderful system. If you have a crook, it's not. And I can remember when I started writing for the Episcopal Church, uh, about the Episcopal Church in the late eight, in the 90s, um, when it was still part of the Episcopal Church, talking to people at 815 who would throw, wring their hands in despair at the utter corruption of the Mexican Church. We'd send them money from New York to do this or that, and it would wind up in new cars or in bank accounts. It was not go to the people. Mexican Church was spun off in the mid 90s, and the corruption still continued. Recently, we're seeing changes. A new bishop was elected in southeastern Mexico, which if you know Mexico, it's the poorest part. That's um, in the Chiapas area. It's where bad things happen. Yes. And, and they brought down a Mexican expat priest who had been in Canada for many years, Bishop Martin, Martin. And he has brought a breath of fresh air into what had been a very dark place. And now in Mexico City, we had a woman elected bishop of the Diocese of Mexico, which is Mexico City and its environs. Now she ran against the former general secretary of the Anglican Church of Mexico, a much older man with a very impressive resume, an insider. She was ordained in 2006, as a deacon, seven as a priest, and is currently dean of the cathedral in Mexico City, which and teaches at the seminary there. She won. 
Now, Mexico is a very male, machismo-oriented culture. So that's quite, quite a, an achievement for a woman. But second, they threw out the insiders. And what we're seeing in Mexico, the church in Mexico, is a move towards reform of good, clean bishops. Somebody, people not tainted by the uh, customs of the past. The prior bishop of Mexico, Carlos Touche Porter, who was primate of Mexico, uh, was a patron of affirming Catholicism, and everybody would talk about, hint, hint, there's a gay primate, and we all knew who they were talking about. Um, Touche Porter left in 2020, and the see has been vacant for the last year and a half, and so they've elected a clean, God-fearing, younger woman so for our friends who have concerns, I think I know where she stands on the women clergy issue. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I think we got that. We're covered on one topic she's uh, in on, but I just, I, for me, it's the contrast. It, you know, uh, Latin America, extremely corrupt, extremely male-dominated. Uh, the family structure is very patriarchal, um, and so is the, the work environment. And so to see this out of you know Mexico City is surprising, and I hope it is in response to the corruption because we've seen it over and over again. It, there's not a day that goes by that some reporter from some small town in Mexico who dared to ask a question about the cartel is dead, or some mayor who was running against corruption uh, in some small Mexicano uh, city is dead, never made it to the polls. Um, they, they don't think anything about taking anybody else's life. Now we can have somebody who hopefully is not corrupt stand for the gospel down there. Now hear us, for, hear me rightly, because mm -hmm. uh, just because she's the first woman bishop in Mexico, I sort of think it's old hat to celebrate the first woman bishop or the first black bishop mm -hmm. or the first minority bishop. I think as a culture and society and as a church, we're way past that. And just because she's a woman, I'm not saying this. The first woman bishop in India, the only woman bishop in India, Pushpa Lalitha, is corrupt. She's dirty. Uh, she continued. She has been a source of stories about the corrupt. Uh, when she was made bishop, she made her brother, the diocesan treasurer, and her nephews all have their fingers in every pie. Mm -hmm. Now people say, well, a woman bishop, she would not be into bullying, she wouldn't be mean, she would be bring a feminine touch. The first woman bishop in Scotland, Anne Dyer, Ouch. Ooh. Yeah. is a repudiation of all those traits that people would like to see in a the in ascribed to a it's mythical like, woman it, leader. It's like the Anglican version of the Godfather over there. It's so bad. <laughs> well, in other words, there are women bishops right now who are crooks. Mm -hmm. There are women bishops right now who are bullies. There are women bishops right now who are harridans and truths mm -hmm. and nasty human beings. Mm -hmm. Then there's some godly people. And in contrast, the gospel centered in their heart. The, in contrast, there are godly women bishops. So, so in other words, just as there are godly male bishops mm -hmm. and ungodly male bishops, mm -hmm. there are godly male bishops and ungodly female bishops. Mm -hmm. If you and I uh, yes, for those who do not believe in the efficacy of women's orders, we're taking that as not as an argument point. Right. We're saying we're looking at the reality. Mm -hmm. So her being a woman is not the issue. Her being a new broom that is hopefully sweeping out the corruption that has been endemic in the Mexican church. I think that's a wonderful sign. Cool. All right, let's move on to our next story. Uh, we posted stories uh, this week and the previous week and uh, maybe a month ago about Bishop Todd Atkinson uh, that the ACNA had formed a group that was going to do an investigation. And the rumors are going around Facebook and um, <laughs> Anglican Inc. in the comment sections. Well, what do you do? We have a right to know what he did. Clearly, this is of the sexual nature and there's going to be victims involved. Or, you know, blah, 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 blah. Hey, pick your topic of um, you know, bishop scandals. 
and we kind of know what what the scandal is about and the investigation and how this all happened and in a very christian like manner we're going to present that to you so that the rumor mill can stop so that we can stop uh judging things we don't know about uh george has been in contact uh with uh, people in the know and we're actually going to quote from a letter in the know that uh, uh, was sent in, to, in the initial part of this investigation. So let's backtrack out. Uh, oh my gosh, there's a bishop being you know investigated for a scandal. It must be sex, George. <laughs> Which I got to say, in the past, in every denomination, that could have been true. This is different. I think we need to preface this by saying mm. that we have no access to the current investigation. No. So we are not betraying any confidences. No one on the investigatory team has spoken to us or revealed anything about the current charges. We just are well aware of the backstory and can make conclusions that we believe drive this. So it may very well be something completely different uh too many unpaid parking tickets in saskatoon and medicine hat and for the canadians that's a terrible thing or it might be what we're talking about we're talking well, and these are initial concerns that were brought forth a while back and from the oh, off the record conversations we had these still pertain 2018 the ANIC, Anglican Network in Canada, which is a diocese, a jurisdiction of the Anglican Church in North America, mm -hmm. their Senate Council, their council uh, was asked to look at bring, having fellowship with two groups, Via Apostolica, led by Bishop Todd Atkinson, and the Anglican Mission in Canada, which was the AMIA's old Canadian branch. Via Apostolica was primarily white congregations on the prairies. Uh, AM Anglican Mission in Canada was heavily Chinese, Asian, Vancouver, yeah. Asian Chinese, hmm. Chinese, uh, yes, uh, Vancouver, Toronto. The Anglican Mission in Canada had been around since the very beginning and had worked with and been in sort of unofficial fellowship with the ACE ANIC since the beginning. Via Apostolica sort of appeared on the horizon. And at that meeting, the delegates were asked to bring on board Via Apostolica as a missionary jurisdiction, missionary district, or whether they should be a diocese in formation. And members of the council meeting that year were a little nonplussed because they're Canadians. And why do I say that? Well, they really hadn't had an opportunity to f battle this out. And Todd Atkinson and the Via Apostolica clergy were there at the meeting. So if you wanted to get up and say, hey, hey, wait a second. What do we know about these guys? They didn't know anything, but they didn't want to stand up and embarrass the people next to them. That's the sort of the Canadian way. You know, you're polite to people. Terminal politeness. Um, and also there were issues where it was said that charlie masters basically strong-armed the council by basically giving them an hours or so discussion and notice and background and it was an up or down thing what and so they voted to bring in via apostolica and it was not a unanimous vote whereas the anglican mission in canada was said well we need more study and discernment and for some people it came across as that the people from the prairies look like us and sound like us well, we're not too sure we want to make up with the uh, the Chinese, a uh, bishop of Chinese extraction, Chinese Asian background, who we've been sort of been our competitor in starting up from the AMIC. So AMIC was postponed via Apostolic was brought on board. So there was initial concerns about unfair treatment, canonical process, lack of a clear coherence. And then the fourth and on November 30th, 2018, a letter was written, signed by a half dozen very prominent ANIC clergy. And it was a copy was uh, given to us. And it was given to us, well, you can't really say anything about it uh, because this is a work in process. And uh, we sort of sat on it. 
um, where the fourth thing was that Todd Hunter, uh, I'm sorry, Todd Atkinson, uh, has, uh, there's some questions about his doctrine and theology and discipline. Well, we were basically left well enough alone because the Charlie Masters and company didn't act on this letter and there was no, st there was no there there. Now come back to this year. Earlier this year, another person sent me a copy of this letter and said that we're moving against Todd Atkinson because he's at it again. What was he at it again? Todd Atkinson from the pulpit expounds extra biblical revelation. What does that mean? God told me this. Now on one level, this is what Gene Robinson would say, God is doing a new thing. But Todd Atkinson wasn't propounding things on homosexuality, he was propounding different issues. And also in his pastoral fellowship with people, I guess for those of a weaker faith, of a weaker character, he was very strict in their following his lead and discipline, up to the point that some people accused him of cult-like behavior. So Todd Atkinson, so putting two and two and two together and coming up with something around four or six, however many twos I said, it looks like the complaints against Todd Atkinson are not about moral character. They may well be, and we just are totally clueless. <laughs> but the rumblings in the background from ANIC clergy are that he is propounding the gospel and teaching doctrine in ways that are foreign to the Anglican way, where bishops do not have personal and private revelation. Uh, I mean, we went through this during the uh, English Civil War, the Reformation. Yeah, absolutely. This is that, this has that, been handled. Bishops don't have special revelation. revelation. Mm -hmm. um, they pass on the faith. They don't mm -hmm. make it up as they go along. That's mm -hmm. unkind, but that's what we've had a bishops in the Episcopal Church make it up as they go along. Mm -hmm. Charles Benison, Jack Spong, Gene Robinson, so on and so forth. Catherine Jeffrey Shorey makes yeah, up canons as it, she goes along. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a long list. So, but, so that's the bad news. What's the good news? I compare this investigation by the ANIC. Well, they, that, what's handing with that? They put together an investigatory team and I've looked at the members of the team and I was impressed. There are no duds. Hmm. Uh, if when you, how these things work, you can sort of tell what they want the outcome to be. Um, if you, uh, if you put certain people on that committee, you know you want nothing to happen. If you put uh, paper pushers on certain committees, you just want a foregone conclusion to be foregone and concluded. Absolutely. And if you, and if you put some blowhards who will talk about one issue to mm. exhaustion of everybody else, yeah. when that issue is not the issue mm. before them, mm. that's what you do. Yeah. Or then you put together a real committee. And this looks like a solid committee. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see them really look into this and whether Todd Atkinson needs to be reeled in a bit, whether he needs to be disciplined, whether his jurisdiction needs to be folded into the ANIC, and he made a suffragan or an assistant bishop not have his own missionary district. I'm just, I'm just speculating. Sure. But the good news is, is the ACNA is not afraid to address head on embarrassing issues. I mean, you remember, Kevin, when we talked about the Church of Nigeria's gospel pros prosperity gospel guy? He's the still US. out there, George. He's still out there. And the Church yeah. of Nigeria fought this tooth and nail, and it took basically brave ACNA clergy like Matt Kennedy mm -hmm. to point out his heresies. And the Church of Nigeria solved it by saying, don't do it again. And so, see, Matt, we told him not to do it. <laughs> And then to the guy who did it, well, you stay in the U.S. and don't let us hear any more complaints about you, and we yeah. won't follow up what you're doing. Yeah. So the Church of Nigeria's response to shame was to sort of cover it up. ACNA is seeking to always be refor semper reformata, always reforming itself, always making sure that it is work is being done by godly people. Yeah, and that's, I mean, we have addressed the accountability within the ACNA uh, since day one. 
they have held themselves accountable. They've done it publicly. There's never been any hidden linen uh, that has been soiled. You get to see the soiled, soiled linen uh, as they try to, to clean up after some messes. And, and they have plenty of messes. For a 10-year-old, 11-year-old body of uh, the ACNA, um, I'm going to get a little, a little older than that. Sorry if my, my math is off. Um, they've had their share of uh, issues. I look at GAFCON now, and I don't see any provincial level accountability. Um, it, it's it's stark in how that this consider the body that was put together um, to hold one another accountable, to be a way forward for the Anglican Communion, to be an alternative to what was happening in the Church of England in America, uh, Canada, and around the world. You know, GAFCON was that step forward. Now, not so much so. So much so that I'm watching a uh, a reading, something on Anglican.inc written by Russell Powell, that kind of hints, hey, you know, maybe GAFCON isn't what we thought it would be, but the global self certainly looks like it could be. And there's, whoa. So uh, just a, a year and a half of no accountability within GAFCON, or less than accountable within GAFCON, it, it's fallen apart so much so that people like Russell Powell and the Diocese of Sydney are looking at the Global South as an alternative. If I'm reading this press release correctly, help me out here, George. Kevin, I think you've, uh, you've got it spot on. Uh, this is a case of the dog that did not bark in the night. Um, <laughs> Russell, is everything uh, a reference to, you know, uh, famous Sherlock? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got one source of reading, so I mean, okay, well, why do I say that? Kanishka Raphael, the new Archbishop of Sydney, is a leader in GAFCON and was invited to the Global South meeting. He's not a primate, but uh, as Sydney has been a center of GAFCON, Sydney led the charge at Lambeth 98, Lambeth 2008, it was one of the original. Sydney has always been basically a semi-province uh, for all intents and purposes. And we've had three arch, four archbishops, Harry Goodhue, uh, Peter Jensen, uh, uh, Davies, uh, uh, Davies, Glenn yes. Davies, Glenn Davies yeah. and Kanishka Raphael. Yeah. Oh, the neurons aren't firing <laughs> properly. I apologize. That's why we live in Florida. We're aged. <laughs> each, each have carried the standard high in the international Anglican field, mm -hmm. where Sydney punches far above their weight. And uh, hold on, that's a compliment. Russell in case, it, in yeah. case you're not American, that's a compliment. I mean, it's a lightweight by weight fighting in the heavyweight division and mm -hmm. doing well. Yes. There, I have a boxing reference, Kevin, not just Good. a Sherlock Holmes <laughs> reference. And what's interesting is. We saw under Peter Jensen, especially, uh, a very strong GAFCON-centric worldview. Uh, Glenn Davies didn't walk away from that, but he wasn't as strong. Kanishka Raphael is keeping the GAFCON line open, but he is being effusive in his praise for the Global South Coalition. And as I read this statement by Russell Powell, who's their press guy and who's one of the best out there, he mm -hmm. really... Uh, you have to read him carefully because he's not just regurgitating. He is, you, you can follow the thinking of the leaders if you read him because he, he's on the ball. What we're saying is that the global stuff is becoming, a, it's being more Anglican as they see it because it is not seeking to be political but confessional, confessional based on a book of common prayer in its various iterations across the communion. And so that there were being not confessional in the sense of uh, Jerusalem Declaration confessional, but being confessional in a Book of Common Prayer sense, which would permit male clergy and female clergy, male bishops, female bishops, different understandings, remarriage and divorce. Um, it would not permit same-sex marriage, for instance. But by keeping, by focusing on the prayer book as the source of unity and the heritage and tradition rather than 
newer, more uh, doctrinal agreements that we've seen broken and fellowship agreements we've seen broken, specifically over women bishops where Sudan and Kenya have violated them and there have been no consequences. It looks like uh, Sydney is starting to sell its GAFCON shares and in investing in Global South Anglican. I hate to say it, but that's what I see. You know, somebody is shorting GAFCON and uh, um, going long in, in the Kevin. Zone. You're the you're the stock pro. What's the what's the government form that you have to file if you're an insider selling stock in your company? <laughs> and <laughs> with, the securities, and <laughs> with the Security securities. Exchange Commission, it's form two thirty two. And uh, oh boy, I've had to fill that out. But um, so so it, so we're seeing Form Two Thirty Twos being filled out by uh, Sydney, <laughs> and smart smart stock people when they see the insiders selling, yeah. they um, don't buy, they no, sell. But I don't think it's too late for Gafcon. Gafcon can say, okay, we see the people want us to be more conciliatory, and we go forward. Who knows? But. Uh, I, I would love to see in the future an amalgamation of Global South and GAFCON to the point where GAFCON is just not a geographical representation of a certain uh, location of Anglican provinces. That it, it, well, it's we more. Need, we need, I think we need to also shoot the elephant in the room as well as address the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Why has why GAFCON reached this point? And this will really upset people. Uh, who are already upset with us anyway? So what does it matter? Yeah, I already. Uh, but I think, I, but I think the Nigerians have uh, have uh, not been helpful. Yeah. Um, there's still uh, we've not had a Peter Akinola again, somebody who has the charisma and the global wisdom and strategy to balance the competing needs of the Nigerian church and the global church. And the communication that we had in the past is not there anymore. And we're in a position where it seems like Foley Beach every other week is having to go over to Nigeria to straighten out something. In other words, the whole uh, uh, Cana uh, saga of the Church of Nigeria needs an Orthodox, needs to have a lifeline for an Orthodox Anglican presence in America. Well, what was the ACNA if it not an Orthodox Anglican presence? And well, from what we, we need see now, it's uh, ACNA, through its accountability, has proven itself over and over again, where we've seen so, less than from other provinces. So, from the whole basically sticking the thumb in the eye of the ACNA, the Nigerians, mm -hmm. to the, the recent Michael Nazarali flap. Uh, ben Quat, uh, Foley Beach and other leaders of, the Glo of, Ang of GAFCON mm -hmm. wrote sad notes saying, we're sad to see you go, Michael, but thank you for all that you've done for us. You're tr we truly see you as a man of God. Well, the first to break the polite note campaign were the Nigerians where Henry Ndukaba, in roundabout terms, basically said this man has chosen to leave. You know, as for us, we will stand with the Bible, uh, which the implication is Michael Nazarelli has rejected the Bible and is going over to the floor on the Tiber. And that allowed the more traditional pop, that gave cover then for the uh, GAFCON Australia and the GAFCON in Ireland and uh, English churchmen and other Protestant leaning publications and groups within the GAFCON coalition to say what they were really thinking, which was Michael Nazarelli, we feel betrayed because you've made a deadly mistake. And then the Nigerians sort of hit back at Foley Beach and, and Ben Kwashi saying, why are you being so nice to this traitor? Are, you know, what are you saying about the Protestant and the Anglican tradition by wishing this traitor well? And so Foley Beach and Ben Kwashi had to put out a very carefully worded statement that still upheld their esteem for Michael Nazarelli as a person, but reaffirmed the tenets of the Anglican way. That was, out of, that was a Nigerian push. Mm -hmm. So 
by moving to a uh, an entity that has le that basically was started in opposition. The Global South, uh, John Chu, the Archbishop of Singapore, couldn't stand. There's a personal animosity with some of the original GAFCON founders. So he kept his arm's length and he formed his own organization. And now Chu was off the scene and the original GAFCON generations off the scene. Now we're seeing them sort of come together at sorts. Yeah. Yeah. I am not shorting my GAFCON stock yet. I put too much time into GAFCON to give up yet. However, um, I have bought some Global South stock. I, I'm, you know, just slowly, uh, daily cost averaging my, my, uh, George will know what that is, uh, my buys into the Global South. Uh, it's a great organization. Um, we'll have to see what happens. But understand this the ACNA right now is not the problem. The ACNA has lived up to its promises and is a beacon of light as a province of the Anglican Communion. But there's a lot of problems elsewhere. So, George, um, oh, there's a fun story. Should have been our good news story uh, to, to have a, a, a priest lock himself to a fence to save the world from the methane explosions that are going on left and right, causing, and here I'm, I'm going to get another check mark from YouTube, climate change. Uh, to occur. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to put up a quick picture here to get the time. Uh, this is what YouTube thought of our last um, talk on climate change. They put up a little warning. Listen, people talk about climate change all the time. Most of them are wrong, and we want you to know that. <laughs> so, thank you, YouTube. We're not me. saying anything about George and Kevin. No, no. But most of them are wrong. Most of them are wrong. <laughs> so, I'm going to put a picture up of that up. And so uh, there's a New Zealand priest who's set, he's figured out a way. And I'm going to help him with the suggestion after George talks more about the story. I received a press release that was so perfect. I had no desire to change a word of it. So I just printed it as is. A New Zealand priest, a New Zealand Anglican priest, accompanied by three others, have locked themselves to the front gate of a dairy farm to protest bovine methane of uh, uh, methane emissions, cow emissions, cow farts. Uh, I don't think we don't want to say farts on the air, do you? Uh, gas emissions, yeah, emissions will do. Wind, cow wind, <laughs> yes. uh, passing wind. I, well, however, you say it in your vernacular. Mm -hmm. um, we'll use a good Chaucer word, a fart, um, old English. Uh, it in New Zealand is one of the principal sources of uh, global warming, uh, the coalition that put out the statement said. Mm -hmm. And so they will chain themselves to this dairy farm fence until the end of COP26 to make sure global leaders act now to stamp out cow farts and burps. Well, you see, and here, here's where you were just inaccurate, George, and this is how people get inaccurate when they talk about global oh, uh, climate sorry. change. You said global warming. We haven't had global warming for 12 years. That's why we use the word climate change. Okay, don't go falling down the, the wrong uh, wording here. The correct doctrinal wording for climate change is climate change. You can't say cooling. You can't say acid rain anymore. Don't you dare mention acid rain or the, all the things of the 70s. It's climate change, and that encapsulates all the things we need to pay for. Oh, I wonder, there are more sheep in New Zealand yes. than uh, cows. I wonder if sheep uh, uh, emet sheep give off the same degree level of uh, methane emissions. Um, and, and maybe New Zealand can come to the world's leading producers of natural gas. Maybe we can solve the energy crisis and have clean, green energy, uh, little bags attached to the back of cows. But I'm glad to see the Anglican Church in New Zealand is really really out there on the cutting edge proclaiming the gospel to cows uh behind the fence at the uh, dairy yard uh that should have been a good news story but it wasn't uh we also we have an up it, well, we also justin welby yeah that's, that's the last one is the ambush yeah. uh justin welby and it was ambushed uh by uh, a country in need of political reform 
and I thought we need to talk about it because I kind of feel sorry for Justin when this happened because his role as an ambassador, his role as an Archbishop of Canterbury, his role as a political type person, this happens. And I can see how this would happen. And in this story, I do feel sorry for Justin Welby. When people say, read these papers and take them to your government, hurry now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Justin Welby is at COP26 in Glasgow and has been up there and back uh, talking about the dire need. And, oh, I think, was it last week or the week before we talked about his those who do not uh, accept climate change or climate skeptics are as bad as Nazis. That's and a, are a genocidal. 696, yeah. They're a, they are homicidal maniacs. Well, he apologized for that. Well, one of my favorite word, voca I've learned a lot of my vocabulary by reading uh, P.G. Woodhouse novels as a young man. Mm -hmm. And I have always loved the word gormless, G-O-R-M-L-E-S. There are photos this morning in the Zimbabwean state press, the Harare Herald and the Bulawayo, I forget, that shows Justin Welby. And the flash was a little too close. So he is wider than I am. He's, his collar is, you know, how his collar pops out a few inches from his neck. His ears are lit in such a way that he looks like Prince Charles with huge jughead ears and his neck is thin and and he's open open mouth looking at this letter handed to him by a delegation of Zimbabwean churchmen, none of whom are Anglican, who accompanied the president of Zimbabwe to COP26. And this this petition from government affiliated, government supported churchmen, which does not include the Anglican churches in Harare in Zimbabwe, asking Britain to end its um, uh, embargo uh, on Zimbabwe to allow the dictators and the generals to have free reign and be able to get to their money in Switzerland and stop the uh, stop the shipment of stop prevent the, the crackdowns on Zimbabwe bad behavior and so they ambushed Justin at this conference with cameras ready and and he's all seen with them praying and the Zimbabwe group newspapers are saying the Archbishop of Canterbury will be championing our cause uh, with the British government to end the terrible uh, embargo on Zimbabwe. And if you actually read what he said is, oh, well, thank you, I'll give these papers to the government. So poor Gormless Justin Welby um, just did not have a good press week up at COP26. No. From his Nazi comments to being made to look uh, buffoonish by the Zimbabwean uh, toadies to the dictator. Well, it's, as I said, he did nothing wrong. It's just no nobody was victorious at COP twenty six except for the vegetarians. Those people who want to stop methane production from coming from cows and sheep and hogs and other animals have won the day, and they largely won the day because uh, climate. Uh, change people need somebody and all they have left is the vegetarians we can get the vegetarian lobby in here and promise that we will stop methane emissions which are so little in global change the you know here's methane emissions here's fossil fuel here's the sun <laughs> here's solar cycles that affect climate change um now, it, now, it, Kevin, it's cute that the, the vegetarians had their day Kevin, you're a STEM guy. You're a science technology guy. I, uh, I, I've do, had. Are, yeah. do, do fish give off methane emissions? Because I don't see a lot of bubbles in the ocean. So no, okay, well, you don't have to be vegetarian. You can be a pescatarian. Because <laughs> my daughters have been pescatarians, vegetarians, vegans. They've been on the Atkins diet. They're on the <laughs> keto diet right now. Um, so I try to keep all this straight. Uh, no, OK. As I've always said, Climate change has happened since day one. When God said, let there be light, the climate has been a changing. And it doesn't take too much for a scientific brain to look back at the history of the glaciers, 
of uh, the, the continents as they moved around here on the earth uh, over millions of years to say- I'm starting to hear you speak in a Carl Sagan voice yeah, of yes, billions, billions and billions, and billions, of, billions of, of stars to figure out that actually the climate has been very stable here for the last 6,000 years. Oddly so, if you look at the entirety of, of uh, the Earth's history. Um, except there's one time we had a, a, a little mini ice age that happened in Iceland and Greenland uh, uh, several hundred years ago that wiped out the Vikings. And, for, and remember, know. Kevin, it rained last week in Florida. <laughs> it rained. So, I, you know, when I take history into account, I take all history into account. Uh, when, when I when I have uh, I, my favorite part of Facebook uh, is looking for a person on Facebook who doesn't understand gender, who doesn't understand race, dictate to me about climate change. <laughs> just like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, oh, thank you, Facebook. And I just, uh, it's just not worth it anymore, George. So that is our show. We've hit six ninety nine. Friday, we will sit down and we will record episode 700. I don't have any uh, ideas uh, that we can really pull off. It'll just be another episode, except it will be a Friday episode. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 699 of Anglican Unscripted.